Good evening. This uh, lecture, Lezrat Hashem, will be Leilu Nishmat Rita Mazal Bat Ksia and uh, Svatlana Golda Bat Serach and Rafael Ben David and Lavdi Lerefuat Yona Bat Ksia and uh, Dvora Elisheva Bat Sara. A few announcements. Uh, for those who have iPhones, my app had a little bug and it was fixed that when you minimize the screen, the speed change. Now it's fixed. If it's not fixed by you, you need to update the app. If the update doesn't work, delete it and reinstall it on a spot and it will fix it. And the calendar should work now. It should not be confusions about the time of the, of the lectures and the locations. Also, one more announcement. I want to tell everyone about this amazing hotline, it's called Inspiration on the Go. It's short daily three minutes lessons on modesty, uh, available there, you know, and uh, people can get these lessons by email also, texting, WhatsApp, uh, just by signing online. Inspiration on the Go 26.com. Bezrat Hashem. Uh, people see a lot of miracles just by committing themselves to join for 40 days, right? And they are, they're having 40, 40 ladies join for 40 days or by having 40 women. So Bezrat Hashem, this is on top of what I said yesterday in my lecture in Queens, that a lot of people see miracles by reading Mishnayot every day, three, four Mishnayot daily, constantly, not to skip a day, and request whatever they really need, those who need Shiduch, a lot of miracles were, were made. I already got two emails today that people did it, and already they had, <laughs> one first day, they had a miracle. <laughs> no, Baruch Hashem. Of course, all the Sgulot, Sgula comes from the word Mesugal. Mesugal means able. Sgula means ability. It gives you extra ability. You know, it's just like when you have a car, you drive. The car has an X, X amount of speed. But when you turn into the sport mode, it becomes a lot more powerful. Without the sport mode, it barely moves. Once you hit the sport, it, it flies. That's gula. The car drives without the sport mode. It has the whole thing. But this extra little push makes it a lot better. That's the whole concept of Zgulot, but make no mistake, you first need to have a car, and it has to be in perfect condition. That's when the sport button will help you. If there's no car, you can press until tomorrow. So you first need to keep Torah and mitzvot and modesty and Shabbat and emunah in Hashem, and now you can add certain Zgulot. By the way, not all the Zgulot are reliable. Some are made up. This gula of the Mishnayot, the Gaon Mivilna already spoke about it 250 years ago. It says that it gives a person very strong power to fight the evil inclination, the Yetzer Hara. So yesterday I spoke about the parasha we read on Shabbat, parashat Baalotcha, for men only. For the women, that's why I gave today an option for the women. All right, so uh, I spoke about Parashat Baalotcha. There's a little bit more left to talk about it. And if we have more time, we go to Parashat Shlach. Remember, in Israel, they're one week ahead of us. So they already read Shlach over there. Now, this coming Shabbat, they're going to have Parashat Korach. We're going to have Shlach, the story of the Meraglim, the spies. They're going to have the story of Korach. Eventually, we'll catch up to them. In the parasha, we see something very interesting that it's written, Daber el Aaron v'amarta elav be'alotcha et anerot. Hashem said that Aaron has to prepare and to light the candles in a menorah, in a mishkan. Aaron never entered Israel, so he didn't have the chance to be in Eretz Israel. In Eretz Israel, it's a permanent Bet Amigdash, permanent temple. But in the meantime, while they're in the desert, it's portable. It moves from place to place. 
So the Gemara is going to explain to us למה נסמכה פרשת המנורה לפרשת הנשיאים? We just spoke about all the sacrifices of all the presidents of the tribes. And why is it close to the story of the menorah? What's the connection between the sacrifice of this president of each tribe to the story of Aaron is going to light the menorah? Obviously, when there are two subjects similar, I mean, two subjects closer to each other in the Torah, close to each other on the Torah, there has to have some kind of a connection. So the Gemara and Rashi brings it up. The Gemara says, לפי שראה Aaron חנוכת הנשיאים, Aaron saw every president bring his sacrifice. He got a little jealous. He felt weak that he doesn't have the merit to participate in that celebration. Not him and not his tribe. אמר לו הקדוש ברוך הוא, חייך, relax. שלך גדולה משלהם. השם told him, relax, calm down. Your merit is greater than them, that you're going to light the menorah, which is higher than what they do. So, you know, we have to understand, what does it mean, חייך שלך גדולה משלהם? ברוך אתה ה' אלוהים המלך העולם שהכל נהיה בדברו. שלך, what does it mean שלך? שלך, literally it means your mitzvah is greater than theirs. But there is a secret here. שלך means your broken heart, your broken heart that you could not participate in sacrificing like the president of the tribes is greater for me than all their sacrifices combined. Everything they did, you having a broken heart that you want to fulfill this mitzvah and you can't, already worked it for me more than everything they did. From here we learn the expression, the famous expression, Lev nishbar venitke, Elokim lo tifze. A heart that is down and broken, And now, while you're in such a situation that your heart is broken and sad, and your spirit is low, and you're now praying to Hashem from a broken heart, Hashem cannot turn down your request. This verse appears in the Psalms 51, verse 19. If you remember, I made a whole series about the entire 150 chapters of Tehillim, of Psalms, with explanation of each chapter, what does it talk about, and why it was written, and by whom, and what connection, and some of the secrets there. It's a very inspiring series. Baruch Hashem. The, the Gemara in Masechet Yoma, page 69, The Gemara talks about Anshe HaKneset HaGdola. There was a, a Knesset by the nation of Israel with 120 rabbis and prophets. Obviously everyone was holy and righteous and keep all the commandments and knows the entire Torah. Otherwise he couldn't make it to be a member of the Anshe HaKneset HaGdola. Today is the exact opposite. with an exception to maybe 5% of the people there. At least 95% over there are complete <coughs> ame aratzot, complete ignorant. And most of them there are extremely wicked, extremely, extremely crooked, and crooks, and liars, and deceivers, and thieves, and antisemite, And hey Torah, many of them are mentally sick, literally. This is the situation we live in today, that our government and the members of what we call Knesset, it's similar to Congress, one is worse than the other. And it's interesting how the nation already became used to it. They have clips. 
of what they say and what they say later. It's all the opposite. What they say, oh, that's outrageous. We have to fight it. We, have to, we can never let that happen. A month later, it's great. We have to all encourage it. Hundreds of things like this. Videos, non-stop. People still vote for them. People still vote for them. It's hard to believe. How can it be? Such liars. It's hard mm-hmm. to believe. None of them has connection to Hashem whatsoever. But Baruch Hashem, back then it wasn't the case. And they call it Knesset. Knesset means Litkanes, place of gathering. The Gemara in Masechet Yoma, it's bring, it, the Gemara brings Am, Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Lama Nikra Shman Anshei HaKneset Agdola. Why we call them Anshei HaKneset Agdola? Shechaziru Atara Leyoshna. That they took us back to the legacy days. Brought back the day of glory. How did they do it? The Gemara explained. Moshe Rabbeinu came and say, Ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor v'anora. That's what we say in Filat Shmona Yisrei. Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu ve'elokei avotenu, Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak ve'elokei Yaakov. And now we say, Ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor v'anora. These words came from Moshe Rabbeinu. Then came the prophet Irmia, Jeremiah, and asked, when he saw the Babylonians are destroying the Bet HaMikdash 2,600 years ago, and horrible Nazis, cruel people, walking in the dis- between the destruction of the house of God, and he asked, the prophet asked, where is the Nora? Where is El HaGadol HaGibor Nora? Where is the Nora? It's gone. They go in, do whatever they want here, and Hashem does not make a beep. Nothing. No punishment. Mm-hmm. Can it be? I don't want to say Nora. Then came the prophet Daniel. And he saw the, the horrible situation of exile. And he said, the Goim torturing the Jews, where is the... Where is the... Hashem is a hero? Where is it? I don't see his heroism. He did not want to say Gibor. Then came Anshe Knesset Agdola and say, on the contrary, that's his greatness. That's his amazing skills. Why? Shekoveshet Yitzro. That is in full tolerance and full control. It's not reacting like some fool that someone gets him angry and he loses his temper. He is able to hold back. And that's very, very difficult to do. Sometimes you want to wipe out someone and you have to let him continue to live, continue to give him oxygen, continue to give him money to live, continue to make his entire body function while he's burning the Bet Amikdash. you actually helping him in his horrible mission. Do you know anyone in the world that will be participating in a plan of his enemy to murder him besides the lefty liberals? <laughs> they are very good at that. They do everything they can to help the Hamas killing us faster. The more the better for them. I don't know what they think. They maybe think they are excluded. They don't know the first one they will slaughter is them. Once they have the ability. Do you think they care? Lefty, righty? They care Jews. They want to kill everyone. Just like the Nazis did. The Nazis cared who is a communist and who is a righty, who is a religious one, who is not. No. They killed everyone. So, they said that when... Hashem made a decree and they do, this goyim do what they wish to do. It's their choice. And Hashem let it happen, right? That's his greatness. Shekoveshet Yitzro. And he has a lot of patience until he begins with the revenge against the wicked people. So, 
If you still wonder, אנשי הכנסת הגדולה say, just go and check how many nations wanted to destroy us and still want every second and Hashem is saving us from them against all odds. So obviously, as much as Hashem allowed them to fulfill their plan, He already set a certain limit. Once they're going to get to that limit, they're not going to be able to move on with their plan. The Rebbe Mibrisk, he says that we praise Hashem when, when we pray. We praise Hashem. Ata gibor le'olam Hashem. You are the hero Hashem for eternity. Forever. Why do we have to say forever? For eternity. Why is it not, it's not enough to say Hashem, you ata gibor. You are you the hero. Why do we have to say le'olam? Anyone thought that maybe the strength of Hashem is uh, one day will run out? He may get old, he may, be, he may not be able to run the world like he does now. It will be harder for him, he has to sweat more. Maybe his back will hurt. What exactly is the, is the idea here? That we have to say le'olam. It's a little bit of an insult. It's something obvious. It's rhetoric, rhetorical. It was enough to say, Ata Gibor Hashem. The answer is, Rabotai, when the problems begin and the trouble comes, many Jews begin to ask, where is the greatness of Hashem? Where is the hero that you're talking about? And the answer is, is always here and always strong and will always remain strong forever, for eternity. Sometimes you see how we strike against the nations, sometimes with a sword, sometimes with floods, sometimes with earthquake, and sometimes by not doing anything for the time being. Anything for the time being. That's why we have to have patience. Even when Hashem does not do anything right now, we do, not, we do know that He records and document everything the Goim do against His children. Everything. Not one detail is missing. And everyone in the end will get what they deserve. We have to know this. You know... It's written in the parasha, the word menorah, it's written four times. Four times. Afraim Kanievsky bring that sometimes it's a menorah with the vav, sometimes it's a menorah without vav. It's called ktiv chaser. It's a missing letter. Why sometimes it's spelled fully and sometimes it's spelled with a missing letter? Either way, you can read it and it sounds the same. The question is why? Is it random? Of course not. Everything is planned in the Torah. So the answer is, Moshe Rabbeinu made the menorah, the menorah that Moshe made was in the first temple, as the Gemara in Masechet Menachot, page 92, the Gemara say when the, when the temple was destroyed, who took it? The Babylonians, the Kasdim, they took it to Babylon. That's where Iraq is as it's written in the end of the book of Yirmiyahu, the prophet, when they build the second temple, right, it's written in the book of Ezra, that they took all the tools and everything, all the utensils of the temple, that was in Bavel, right? Everything went to Bavel, including the menorah, the Moshe Rabbeinu made. This menorah existed until the time of the Greeks. The Greeks impured it. They made it not pure. And you couldn't use it anymore, like the Gemara in Avodah Zarah, page 52 says. When the Maccabees, the Beta Hashmonaim, they won the war against them, they made a new menorah. But there was no wealth at that time. So they just made it with the pieces of metal. You know, that you use on a grill to, 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 to uh, 
barbecue, you know, some shish kebab. With pieces like this, which is kosher, but barely, but the avid. Then, then after that, when they became wealthy, they made another menorah from silver. Pure silver, that's already precious. By the way, today, silver is not really, silver is not really expensive. It's not even 1% of gold. But back then it was very similar, almost, almost the same. Silver was expensive. For whatever reason, silver stayed behind and gold went up to $2,000. And silver is about 20-something dollars, 1%. Even though if you see a nice menorah from silver and a nice menorah from gold, there's not that much of a big difference between. Both of them are nice. But when they became wealthier, they actually made a silver menorah. Yeah, silver. You need to mix something with the silver, otherwise it's too soft. Once it's too soft, it's not good. You need to put some regular uh, metal or aluminum in and mix it, otherwise, you know, to hold it together. Huh? Also gold. Once they became even wealthier, they made another menorah, this time from gold, which, which, which remained until the destruction of the second temple. So all together, how many menorahs we had? Two of gold, as the, you should do lechatchila, and two, one from metal and one from silver, that they only kosher be the eved, after the fact, when there is no other better way. That's why two menorahs are written fully, with a vav, and two has a letter that is missing to tell you that it's only kosher be the eved, not lechatchila. So you see, even the way the Torah is written in a spelling has a meaning inside. Nothing is coincidence. But you have to see why Hashem sometimes write it this way and sometimes that. And for that you need the, the mefarshim, the commentary. Yesterday I spoke about the 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 request of the, of the nation that they miss Egypt, they miss the watermelons, they miss the zucchinis, they miss the garlics and the onions. So how can it be? Someone came out of Auschwitz while he's on the way to the United States in the middle of the ocean, he began to scream at the captain, take me back to Auschwitz, I miss the steaks and the fish that I was eating there and the desserts. Everyone would say he became crazy. It's not normal. Who gave him anything to eat there? <laughs> they suffer hell on earth. What is the point of thousands of people coming to Moshe with lies? <coughs> we miss the watermelons. And I explained yesterday that it wasn't the Jewish nation. It was the Erev Rav, the Egyptians. They are the one who makes almost all the problems. <coughs> Today I want to ask another question. Later we find that they want meat. They're asking for meat. And Moshe says, why do I have to get the meat? Did I give birth to them? What kind of an answer is this? Did I give birth to them? Who cares, you give birth to them or not? What's the connection? You're the leader. They're coming to you. They make a complaint. Transfer the complaint to Hashem. What is the meaning of the words, did I give birth to them? Meaning, am I their biological father? Now let's see who's clever here. What law you learn from this verse? Very good. But there it goes a little bit deeper. You're in the right direction. You have to take care of your children. It's a very common problem that uh, a couple get divorced. Divorce is a pandemic now, officially. Almost everyone gets divorced, unfortunately. What's the reason for the divorce? I can give you a list. You ready for the list? 
You ready? Tov, I'll tell you the list. Not necessarily the list that I'm going to give you now, it's not necessarily by the importance. So don't, don't think that I'm starting from the most severe to the less severe, or the other way around. Whatever comes to my mind. So one thing I could say is addiction to material. I'd rather die than to be poor. I'd rather die than not having a cleaning lady. I'd rather die than not having a fancy carrier in Flatbush showing up to all my friends. I'd rather die than not get diamonds and all kinds of necklaces and all these things. I'd rather die than not having three maids in a house, include a personal chef. I'd rather die than not going three times a year to Cancun or to Florida or to Miami for Pesach and for Sukkot or to Israel. With this kind of mentality, it's very, very difficult to maintain a Jewish kosher home because the, this addiction to material is the exact opposite of the Torah, the exact opposite. The Torah says, "Pad b'melach tochal, u'bay b'mesorat yishtev, al aretz atayashen, v'chayetzar atachai, v'chtichye." The Torah gives a list of things how do you can become a successful holy talmid chacham, and one of the biggest enemy of this mission is the addiction to food, and to jewelry, and to cars, and to homes, and to women, and to sport and basically to the things that the Greeks loves, or the modern Greeks of today, the Americans. So the more you are Americanized, the less chance that your marriage will be successful. You should know that. That's the truth, unfortunately. It's not necessarily Americans only. It's Europeans and Israeli secular. Same idea. Same idea. Next enemy of the marriage institution is horrible personality traits. Nobody care about his horrible personality traits. No one is trying to fix it. No one is learning how to fix it. And most people are not even aware of how horrible they are in the eyes of God. And that's where the problem begins. When you don't know that you're sick, there's no chance for you ever to be cured. You only can treat your cancer after the MRI showed you you have cancer. As long as you didn't get tested, you live in some kind of an illusion. If you have pain here and there, you think it's different reasons. You don't pay attention that your life is in risk. So most people are not even aware how horrible is their situation spiritually. So when you have an angry wolf and a person full of ego and laziness and selfishness and stinginess, can he be a husband? <laughs> In his dreams he can be a husband. A house like this will not survive here. If the girl is lazy, if the girl is not modest, if the girl is not faithful, if the girl is not clean, meaning personally and the house, or she's not going to be a good devoted mother or a great wife or whatever. Not even talking about intimacy and attraction and all these things. Obviously, it's very important as well. So the chance to maintain a kosher home, if they survive six months, it's already a miracle to begin with. Another reason is that the shidduch was not the right one to begin with. She only married him because he's some kind of a successful businessman, which will give her a nice castle and a nice car. She sold her soul to the devil. No connection between her and him. That's why you sometimes find out some kind of a prostitute married, she's 20, married someone 80. Obviously, everyone knows why. Nobody needs to ask why, right? In Vegas, you see all these losers. As soon as you come out of the plane, you see two things that hits you in your face. One is the machine, slot machine. Second thing, you see all these cowboys with their boots, eight years old, 
someone that can be not his granddaughter, grand granddaughter, <laughs> with no shame. The shame is totally lost. Okay, now what do you expect from this culture in, in Vegas? We're not talking about them. We had no expectation from this kind of Gentiles. We're talking now about our religious communities. Secular people, I don't know why they're getting married for. It's unheard of. What's the point? What's the point? You're putting yourself with your own hands inside a furnace in hell. That's going to have such a horrible end, that, that marriage. After a year maximum, court, lawyers, tens of thousands of dollars, not seeing the children, child support. They are. It's going to regret the moment he was born. Him and her. Why are they getting married? I don't understand. Anyway, the marriage means nothing to them. It's a boyfriend and a girlfriend before, and a boyfriend and a girlfriend after. Same thing they did before they do after. It's not like, oh, now he was in Facebook all day having 500 friends, female, and after he got married, that's it. He doesn't have it anymore. He stayed the same. So what is the purpose of, oh, going on his knees, will you marry me? Listen, you fool, get up before you're going to fall a lot deeper. But that's them. You have to be super stupid to have expectation that their marriage will be successful. You may say, come on, don't exaggerate. Here and there we find secular people that live happily, happily married. Yeah, one out of a thousand. Every rule have an exception to the rule. One out of a thousand. I'm not making fun here. This is very sad. But I'm just describing the, the horrible situation the world became. That's what's, all, that's what's going on. I want to focus on the Orthodox community, which the situation over there is also deteriorating terribly. One other reason the Shidduch to begin with wasn't it. The Shatchanim push. They want to get cash. The greed. It's a rich guy. He's going to give her $5,000, 10 I don't know what they give today. There are some rich people that cannot get married until later age. They come to the Shatchan or the Shatchanit. If you find me a Shidduch in this year, I'm going to give you $50,000. 50000 I don't make it in 10 Shidduchim. Yes. You want, I'll sign that for you. All she does is busy on this Shidduch. She's going to find someone. You know what uh, one rabbi once said, you know what's the Rashi Tevot of Shatchan? Shatchan, Shin, Dalet, Kaf, Nun. Shin, Sheker, Dover, Kesef, Notel. Sheker, Dover, speak lies, money takes. Four letters. Sheker, Shin, Dover, Dalet, Kesef, Kaf, Notel, Nun, Shatchan. So, I, I don't say that all the Shatchanim are like that, but the nature of the Shatchan, that he is pushy. Sometimes for his own good, sometimes for the person's good. He represents someone, the boy or the girl, they are dying to see them getting married. Sometimes it's not even for the money. Some Shatchanim don't even want money. Besides a little thing, because you have to give something. They're not really, they're very rich. They're not, they're not doing it for the money. They're loaded. What's two, three more thousand dollars going to do for them? It's not even the issue. The issue is that they're already embarrassed after three, four years. What, what can I say to the guy? I don't know where to hide. He's having expectation from me. He's expecting, especially when I married so many others. And well, what's with me? What's going on with me? Someone just wrote me a message on, on the way here. Well, he's hosting a guy in his house Friday night. Friday night. The guy is uh, old and is not married. I don't know how old. He didn't say exactly the age, but old. Meaning he should have been married with kids by now. So the guy said to him, that's it. I decided I don't go to marriage, to weddings anymore. I don't go to weddings anymore. He asked him why you don't go to weddings. 
I can't take it. Why? Every, everyone comes to me and say, Bekarov etzlecha, Bekarov etzlecha, soon by you. It's like sticking a knife to, to, to my stomach. Kills me. Now the people have such a pity on me. Bekarov etzlecha. People means well. You know? I sometimes do Mishaberach in the shul on Shabbat. So if I see an older guy gets up to the Torah, I want, on one hand I want to give him a bracha that he'll find a shiduch soon. On the other hand, if I say it loud, I don't want to embarrass him. Because nobody knows him here, let's say. Let's see, he's one of my guests, came for Shabbos. The community doesn't know. He may be married, I don't know, he's 50. He's not married, or he's divorced. To say, Bekarov, il chashiduch hagun bimera. On the other hand, if people hear that he's single, it's very good. Maybe someone will have someone for him and ask questions. It happens. It happens in the past. Wow, this guy's not, ma- he's not married. What's his story? Can you tell me? I think I have someone for him. Things like this happen. Why do I have to be embarrassed to give him bracha to get married loud? Because I know people are mentally sick. And their ego is all the way up in the sky. Someone was humbled. I have to be embarrassed to give him a bracha? It's embarrassed what people will say. That's what life is all about. What the people will say. Not what Hashem say. What the people will say. That's one of the things in the religious communities. Everyone is worried what the people or the neighbors or the rabbi will say. What about what Hashem will say? Ah, what Hashem will manage. It's good. You know? So what other reasons? People don't live modest lifestyle. Internet, movies, uh, they're exposed to so many bad things, the boy and the girl. And life is destroyed. Let's say she's pregnant now and she just gained 80 pounds. What does he do all day? Watching all these models in the commercials. The Yetzirah comes to his head and says, look what you have and look what you could have had. And the stupid guy, six months later, is already thinking, how do I get rid of her? You think I'm exaggerating? I can show you hundreds of reasons, hundreds of marriages that were destroyed because of this. Negligence. People do not take care of their look. It's also a reason for divorce. Who gave you permission to neglect your look? You are... uh, You... You committed to to some kind of a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. It's a partnership. None of the partners have permission to be different than the way that they started the partnership. Unless it's not in his hand. I mean, we get older, it's not in our hand. We're not going to be young forever. But you have to make sure to be clean and not to smell and to take care of your teeth and your gums and your hair and your skin and to take shower in the summer a minimum once, sometimes twice, depending on how humid and horrible and muggy is outside. And you have no permission to gain weight unless the spouse like someone fat. Some people like fat. Some people like skinny. Everyone with his taste. Weight is not just a look. It's also health. It causes diabetics and heart problems and all kinds of other things. Who wants to marry a guy that will die in age 50? It's also a problem. Or that they're going to have to chop his legs off because he have high sugar. Because he doesn't care. In reality, people make all the possible mistakes, and that's why the houses are broken. One of the reasons why people became such monsters is the movies. This, the heart of the cancer is Hollywood. Destroy the world. The media, the, all these things. Destroy the world completely. How many murders, brutal murders and chopping heads and all kinds of gunshots and explosions and throwing people from the balconies people see in average week? 
thousands of cases. Now the brain, the brain cannot tell the difference between reality and a movie. Because when Hashem designed the human being with conscious and subconscious, it was designed to live in a clean world. Then people were bored and decided to create movies. Why? Because there's nothing else to do. They don't learn Torah. They're not busy with mitzvot and tefillot. What are they going to do? They want to sit and watch some kind of an illusion to run out of reality for two, three hours. Right? So because they started to develop all these fake fictions, they made it more and more aggressive and more brutal and more disgusting and more dirty. And the mind, the brain, is a, remember, is a very sensitive computer. It's a video camera. It records nonstop with audio, with video. Sends the recording to the subconscious. The, the brain analyzes the information and divide what you need on a daily basis, what you're going to need once in a while. It's unbelievable how the system works. But in the brain now, the brain understands that we are in a war zone. We are in the middle of a trauma. In the middle of a trauma. I'll give you an example. When someone is now, you just found out that someone is chasing you right now. You saw him from the window. Someone with a gun. What happened to your heartbeat? From 52, it goes up to 120. But you didn't run. You didn't jog. You didn't go to the gym. What happened all of a sudden the heart went to 120? What happened to your blood pressure? What happened to your body temperature? What all these symptoms in your body? You didn't go out of the air condition and your temperature rises and you begin to sweat. Your hands sweat. Your body begins to shake. Your eyelashes begin to vibrate. What's all this? The brain understands there is danger right now and goes into a panic mode. Now remember, the brain doesn't know if it's real or if it's in a movie. So when you begin to see all these horrible things, the brain is very confused. What kind of a life this person is? All days under threat and murders and chopping heads and cursing and beating up. And it turns the person into a monster. That's it. That becomes your nature. That's how they brainwash their brains of all the children in this generation in public schools. All to become gays and to change their gender. That's, they found a way from a very young age. You see in Target, they have clothes of babies. Inf infants. All with these rainbows and all that. Someone sent me today a picture. 2030. I'm going to be executed for refusing to change my gender. It's a joke. It's not so much of a joke. We're heading there. If you're going to be... A, in 10 years from now, one of the only normal people that left in the world, what do you think the not normal people will do to you? They will target you as not normal, which is, by the way, true. If the normal became all murderers, all rapists, all gays, all drug addicts, and finally this, this righteous tzaddik rabbi is going to be not normal. Thank God for that. Who wants to be normal like them? <laughs> You get the point or no? Today automatically when we hear the word not normal, we think crazy. It's really not true. I'm very honored to be not normal. I'm not normal. Yeah. If I see 8 billion people in the world, the last thing I want is to be like them. Or 99% of them. So I'm happy to be not normal. You get the point or no? A woman that dressed modest in 90 degrees in the street of King's Highway, she's not normal. Thank God for that. The not normal people will, will inherit heaven in today's generation. This is how sad it became. It used to be the other way around.
I hear about someone who makes a wedding now to his son. <coughs> How much he's going to spend in two or three hours of the wedding on flowers? More than a hundred thousand dollars. I just told Simantov, he laughed at me. So ah, some people waste half a million dollars a night. Half a million dollars a night for flowers. If a person like this is free to walk in the street, I don't want to live in this world anymore. Someone like that has to be locked in a mental institution. No other word for him. Completely mental. Oh, he may have a hundred million dollars. Ah, huh? it's a good point. So what? Half a million went to the garbage in three hours. He loses it in a casino every once in a while. So why not? At least it's the wedding of his son will look like paradise in the videos while it lasts for six months. You know? Ah, so if you're so generous, let's see you give half a million dollars to the yeshiva and let the yeshiva run for two, three years with his money. Trillions of mitzvot instead of that stupid waste. Now one of them will agree. I'll make a deal with you. Go to all the rich people that making all these fancy weddings over here and other places. Flying so many people, this, business class, catering, best singer, flying the whole world to make such a show. Fireworks, who knows? Bringing a horse with a carriage. <laughs> this whole show became a circus, the wedding. Tell them, just give up on the flower. Put 20,000 on the flower, still look very nice. And 480 give to save souls or to, say, or, to, or to produce Torah. I will do that also. Yeah, 180 a month. 180 bucks. I see these people canceling a monthly recurring donation of $101. I buy businesses stuff. Then I hear the next day they're opening a business for a million dollars, a spa. One on one, that's what bothers them. There's a lot of mental sicknesses out there. I hope for them that they are mentally sick. I really hope for them. At least they will be dismissed from the hell that is waiting for them. Because someone that is mental is dismissed from a punishment. It's a, it's a great relief. Because if they are not mental, wait, what, what, wait what's waiting for them. People are willing to burn hundreds of thousands of dollars on such nonsense. And when someone comes and beg them to help this or to help that, they're so tight. Yeah. There are many things can be done. If I was a Hasidic Rebbe, I would make decrees. The only one who can make decrees, any rabbis who can make decrees in this generation, is only the Admorim. When Rav Shach was alive, he could have said something, almost everyone would listen. We don't have leaders like Rav Shach anymore. When the Lubavitch Rebbe said something, at least he would know tens of thousands of Chabad Nikim would not dare to move an inch left or right from what he said. He had the power to influence them. But today we don't have such leaders, so the only ones who left are the Rebbes. The, this Rebbe, that Rebbe, the Hasidiyot. If I would be one of them, first thing I would say, no one is buying a real fair hat for five or four thousand dollars. Why burning hundreds of millions of dollars? Why? Make a fake one. It looks exactly the same. I saw one fake one. Touch it. You would not know it's not real. $200. That's it. Looks exactly the same. Even if they touch it, they won't know the difference. Why burning $5,000? Why killing thousands of squirrels for this? Or fox or whatever it is. Rabbits. Five is cheap. He is a Hasid. He knows. How much is now? Eight. Eight. Well, if you get Hasid. <laughs> get it. The regular? Wow. 
Or I would make another decree, no real diamonds anymore. Not allowed. They would listen. They admire the Rebbe. They would listen. Why burning millions of dollars on such to yacht? With that money, we can save our children. We can save marriages. We can save orphans. We can save widows. We can make the world a safer and a better place. If I would say it, how many people would listen? 2,000, 3,000 people in the whole world? If you Rav Shach, half a million people would listen. Well, I wish we had people like this that can make such an impact and make the right decrees. Simple wedding, takana, no one is allowed. Simple chicken, little piece of meat, fish, whatever, that's it. No show, no flowers, not 20 musicians. Nobody needs this. We're not in a philharmonic now. <laughs> DJ or a band of three, four people, that's it. Simple, keep it simple. Some people, they make a half a million dollar wedding and then they fight and cheat the yeshiva for the tuition. That's all I can pay. Then they wonder why their children is off the derech one after the other. They still fly three times a year for vacation. They still drive a nice fancy car. They still have a twenty, thirty thousand dollars watch. But when it comes to the tuition committee, it's fighting to save five hundred dollars a month. Let the yeshiva run and collect. Why should I do it? Let them do it. If you're poor, you deserve all the discounts. No question about it. Nobody can stay in public school or go to public school because his parents cannot have money to pay. That's a crime. The reason it happens is because the rich are cheating. For vacation, they spill money like garbage. I saw them. I saw them. Many, many times in places that I was, I see how they live. But when it comes to things that is life and death of eternity, they're all of a sudden cheap. They don't want to pay. And then Hashem sees such a thing. And, he's, and you are setting the priorities in your life. It was a time in the, in the time of Rav Enchanan Wasserman. He used to go and collect money for the yeshiva. He came to the house of a very rich man that gave money every year to the yeshiva. But he came from the back door, from the deck, from the back door to the kitchen. Because he didn't want to come from the front door because it's a lot of nice Persian rugs. And it was a snowy day, you know, muddy. The boots are full of water and dirt. So the boy came to the father and said, Abba, the rabbi is, is waiting for you, but he came from the door, from the back. So the rich man came to the back and said, Whoa, Rabbi, why you came from here? So I don't want to dare the, the, the rugs. Over here in the kitchen, you don't have rugs. He said, no, I disagree, I'm sorry. Go out, come from the front, make sure you bring a lot of mud with you, and walk all over my rugs. Why, why would I do that? Please, it's chinuch. I want to show my kids the last thing I care about is these stupid rugs. That the Torah for me is number one. If my kids will see that the rabbi has to come from the back like a thief because I'm worried about my rugs, that's the end of my life. So the rabbi did it, and the kids then later say, Abba, look what the rabbi did. It's very good. We are honored. We have to kiss his feet. Rabbi, but Abba, but the rugs cost you a lot of money. They pick them up and put them in the garbage. Billion rugs like this is not a second that the rabbi was in our house. Ah, this is a lesson for life. The kids will never ever forget that. What do the kids see today in the house? What are the parents talking about? All kinds of successful people in the community. He built, he did, he bought, he has a plane, he has that. Stuyot, rag stuyot. If they would see the parents admire Bnei Torah, admire Avrechim, they would get more motivation to be Bnei Torah. But if the parents admire professionals, professionals, admire doctors and, and, and uh, 
someone just told me something very, very upsetting to me. There's an owner of a pharmacy told me that. I know, you know, they're in a business. They say, you know, there's a lot of couples that unfortunately cannot have kids naturally. 15% of the couples cannot have kids naturally. So what do they need? They need treatments. So there's a lot of holy organization who help couples to have children. The last option is IVF, where they take the sperm and the egg, fertilize it artificially, put it in, hopefully it will work, sometimes it fails. It costs a lot of money, these things. So there are a lot of good organizations like this, collect money from good rich people that give money, and they give happiness to families who couldn't have kids for years. There are doctors who are in this field. So that person from the pharmacy told me that when the couples go, usually they're poor. They don't have money. Without this organization, they would not even try to start. They don't have thirty, forty thousand dollars to do it. One of the things the doctors do is convincing them to test the eggs, the quality of the eggs, which is completely not necessary. Because the eggs have a way to fix itself. They want to take out of these miserable couples who barely have what to eat, and they are all they have and pray and cry for years is to have a child. The little from their plate, they're already multimillionaires, these doctors. So they send them to a not necessary test, which is six, seven thousand dollars. It's completely not necessary. And not only that, sometimes the egg will be, ba- will be good and will produce a pregnancy. And because of this stupid test, they dump the eggs to the garbage. And they know it and they push for it. And they scare the people. And now you're not a professional. You're not a doctor. They tell you, no, it's very dangerous. If the egg is not good, the baby is going to come bad. This, autism, you know, all these things. Who would want to take such a risk? That's why the Gemara says, Heartless people. The purpose of being a doctor is first is to make people happy to save them, to cure them, to give them hope, to save their life, the quality of their life. Ah, what about the money? Where is your fate? You think Hashem will give you less than what you deserve? Cheating people, miserable people, making them spend, borrow money, borrow from here, borrow from there. Unbelievable what's happening here. There's so many scams out there. So many. How many times you go to the dentist, you barely have a feeling, and he tells you you have a root canal. Three, four thousand dollars to get out of you. And a crown. He makes it root canal. It's not even root canal. And in the end, a lot of them don't even know how to do the root canal. They leave it with infection. It can cause cancer and other problems. And they have to pull it. Risk your life. Same thing lawyers. In divorce cases, they do everything they can to stretch it as long as possible. Such evil people. Of course, I'm not saying everyone is like that. There's always good people, obviously. But I'm just talking about the bad ones. There's good doctors and righteous doctors. And there are doctors who I know personally, when they see a poor person, or especially Bachur Yeshiva, they refuse to take money. Refuse. Like Dr. Cohen here in the... Union Terran Pike in 166th Street, the dentist. Dozens of dozens of Bachure Yeshiva from our Yeshiva, he took care of them for years for free. But not just for free. When they came all the way to, from Muncie to Queens because they cannot afford the dentist, he took them before the customers that are sitting there. Customer is hundreds of dollars each or sometimes thousands. First the Bachure Yeshiva. And he came for a feeling, he also did for him cleaning, and another feeling if it was necessary, and full mouth x-rays. Why? I'm not doing anything for the Bachure Shiva. I love Hashem, Hashem loves Bachure Shiva. I'm honored to please Hashem. That's it. Ah, but you lose money? That's heresy. To even think that. 
that I'm going to give a priority to a holy bachur yeshiva ben Torah, and maybe one of the customers will get up and go, and I'm thinking, wow, I just lost a thousand dollars, because this guy got angry and left. If you think this way, you're not religious. You're not religious. If I had permission, I'll tell you, take your yamaka and throw it to the garbage. That's where it belongs. I won't be able to tell it to you because it's not in, under my authority. But one thing I can tell you, you're not religious, you're faker. Because if you think, I'm going to do something that makes Hashem happy, and in return Hashem will stick a knife in my back and hurt my parnasa, you are not religious, you have zero faith. And your hashkafa is totally rotten. Totally rotten. I always, I, you know, I always remember when, uh, when we used to make thousands of CDs every week. CDs were more popular than today. Today, Baruch Hashem, we do the USBs and the promoting lectures online. But back then, I had a guy, now he's already a few years in Israel, but when he was in Monsi, he had a, a, a business that was producing all my CDs. And uh, he decided that he wants to, do, to make Aliyah. So he wanted to sell the business. What was the asking price? $100,000. He has all the machines, the printers, everything, you know, the office. One Hasid and his son came from Brooklyn. Wealthy. He wanted to buy a business for his son. Looking what to do with that boy. He came in. He showed him all the monthly statement, how much he makes, what's the expenses. He said to him, ah, the price you're asking for too much. I was his main customer, because who else does thousands of CDs every week? Others, they do 100 here, 200 there, when there's a special occasion. I was my man. So basically, if I leave him, he's bankrupt. Because the little that he does here and there will not even cover the rent. So the guy comes and see. So you have one main customer. Almost everything comes from him. If he leaves you bankrupt, so your business basically is dependent on one person. Financially, the Hasid was not stupid. He was right. But then the guy told him, but this business is not a regular business. It's not only money. It's a business that saves the life of many thousands of souls every year. So I'm honored. He was my Baal Tshuva himself, the guy. Him and his entire family. So said, I'm honored that I'm busy with something that I know all these CDs that I put in the envelopes and wrap it and take boxes and deliver them. I'm participating in saving thousands of lost souls every year. So what the Hasid is telling him, that's good for the books. Now let's talk tachles, money. Meaning the Hasid is actually telling him, in case you didn't understand, I can care less about the soul, let them go to the garbage. I only care about another few thousand dollars a month, that's all I care about. What are you telling me, Baalei Tshuva, let them all die. But it's even worse than that. Let them all die is one thing. What about himself? Let me also die. As long as I get a few thousand dollars extra a month. Because the Hasid for sure heard a thousand times since the day he was in yeshiva until that day how important it is to save souls. The Hasidim has the same Gemara, the same Shulchan Aruch, the same Rambam, the same Chovat HaLevavot, the same Yisrael Yishan, the same everything. Their speakers, some of them are the best Musar speakers. They speak about saving souls, Kol HaMatzil Nefesh. There is nothing he didn't know. But he took everything and put it in the garbage for another two, three thousand dollars a month. And he's already wealthy. Here you go. Here is an, an example of someone, all his life is a religious robot, and he's totally not religious. Totally not religious. Because if in the most important thing in the world, in the eyes of Hashem, you step on it and throw it to the garbage like it's nothing, then you are a suspect that you break every possible violation of the Torah behind the scene. You're already a suspect, right? If someone go and shoot people and kill them, you expect him to be a faithful Hatzalah volunteer? What do you do? I'm volunteering to Hatzalah. 
It's very impressive. Oh, it's volunteer to Atzala. He gets on Shabbos a call. He runs. It's impressive before you found out he already murdered 300 people. Once you find out that he's a hitman, and he comes to convince you that he wants to volunteer to Atzala, you know there is a scam here. It has to be something. Right or wrong? I hope you didn't kill anyone. <laughs> you got the point or no? No, of course not. They only care about money. That's reality. There's millions of examples like this. So I say, not all lawyers are like this. Not all doctors are like this. There are very good ones also. Some lawyers even go in. They, they, there's something called pro bono. They take cases and volunteer. I don't know, to all kinds of organizations. I don't know why they do it. Maybe from their good heart. I don't know. Maybe they feel guilty on all the other cases they kill the people. Once in a while, they want to feel good with themselves. But we're not just monsters. We are also good people. Together. What do they call it? The, the Dr. Jekyll and Hyde? Huh? Jekyll and Hyde. Who's the good one? Jekyll or Hyde? Jekyll is the good? <laughs> there are actually people that their name was Jekyll and Hyde? Well, a split personality, no? Huh? Jekyll is Yanko? <laughs> Who is Hyde? Split personality. He hides. He hides his mitzvos or averos. So, the, in divorce cases, I once was in a seminar in Los Angeles. A woman came, can I speak to you? Yeah. I'm, being divor I'm getting divorced now. It's already going on for two, three years. She's telling me now that the lawyers that are arranging this divorce already, listen carefully, already took from her and her husband two villas in Beverly Hills. So far. Meaning the case is still going. I asked her why. You would come to me, I would arrange your divorce for $500. Whatever the, f the, the fees to the court, and that's it. I would, I would make peace between you. You give him this, you give him that. Sign here, sign here. Go to the court, stamp it, finished. Arbitration. What do you need them for? We made a mistake. But why it's not over? They don't let. They don't let. They want to stretch it forever. Every month, send me 15,000, send me 12,000. Two houses we lost. But I had even a worse case than that. I was once in Florida. There was one Italian woman, maybe almost seven years old, something like that. She told me I got divorced. Do you know how much I paid to my lawyer and me and my husband, my ex-husband? My husband had a hedge fund in Wall Street. The lawyers knew he's rich. Guess how much they pay between both of them to the lawyers to settle, to settle the divorce case. Guess how much? No, throw a number. Two huh? Two million. Five hundred thousand. No, no. Huh? A million. Ten million. No? Huh? A hundred what? Ah, hundred million. <laughs> You're not that far. Fifty million dollars. The husband paid thirty-one million, and she paid nineteen million dollars. <laughs> Can you believe it? This was fifteen years ago. Meaning, if the case would be today, it would be what she said: a hundred million. Now, then they ask, why, Rabbi? Why the Gemara said the best of the lawyers are going express to hell? Rav Galinsky went to the hospital in Israel. Rav Galinsky was uh, the greatest speaker, also had very nice sense of humor, meaning his lectures are entertaining, full of knowledge, full of musar, great ashkafa, turns you into a righteous person if you want or if you don't want. 
But uh, he, he had a special sense of humor. His brain was sharp. Immediately, he would, <laughs> from nothing, turn it into a very funny situation. So he went to the hospital in Israel, and the Chiloni doctor is checking his ear. He has pain in his ear, some kind of infection. He checks, you know. He said to him, don't worry, Rabbi. We will take care of your ear. But while I'm doing it, can I ask you a question? I heard that you religious people say, Atov shebarofim la gehenom. The best of all doctors is expressed to hell. Can I ask you why? Why, I'm not a good doctor. Here, I'm not taking care of you. So Avgalinsky told him, what is it relevant to you? You're not the best doctor. <laughs> <laughs> when you be the best doctor, ask me that. <laughs> it gave him one. You got the point? The question is, when the Gemara said the best of the lawyer to hell or the best of the doctor to hell, is that means, and needless to say, the ones that are not the best or only the best? Especially the best, meaning only especially the best, meaning the average ones are okay, no hell for them. Or if the best doctor goes to hell, needless to say, all the losers. Huh? I would think the best doctor, meaning he saves more life, he's, uh, you know, known to be a saver, and he goes to hell. That means everyone else has nothing even to talk about. But it's not guaranteed that that's what it means. It's possible that Dafka the best goes. Why? Maybe because they think they're God, they have good success rate. Maybe they begin to think, I'm a, I'm a God myself. Once I heard a great explanation why doctors and lawyers were on the target of the Chachamim in the Talmud. Why? It could have been many other people. They could have said the same thing about engineers and who knows what else. Carpenters and uh, generals and well, so many. Why do they focus on those two? You know why? Let's see if you're clever. What's special about lawyers and doctors? Huh? I can't hear you. Oh. You are desperate. When you come to them, that means you have no choice. It's the last thing you want is to see a face of a lawyer or a face of a doctor. If you are already there, that means you're desperate and there's no other way. Life and death, like you say. Life and death, or being on the street, or who knows what, or government, or jail. So taking advantage on someone that is in trouble, not feeling a pity for him, not only don't have a broken heart to see a person is crying, suffering, his life is about to be over, and who knows what's next, and take advantage on his situation to rob him or to extend his suffering for personal gain, it's worse than a murder. There's no question about it. There is another reason. Because they deal with people suffering non-stop every day, they got used to it. It doesn't bother them. And Hashem cannot stand it. Hashem cannot stand it that a patient in a room is screaming, ah, I'm dying, give me some more for you, I don't know what. And the doctor checking his text. Hi, honey, what's for dinner tonight? And the guy, ah, in my own eyes I saw it. In my own eyes. I went to my money this. My friend's mother went into the hospital. Nobody expected her to die that night. Her life was not in a risk. While she was there, I had a lecture in Borough Park that night. My money is Borough Park. When I found out, I said, you know what, I'm finishing the lecture. I'm coming to see you there. I, I, it's Mishamayim. Hashem arranged her to be in a hospital the night that I have a lecture there. That I will go there and we will do what necessary before she dies. Otherwise, no one would know how to do it. It's Mamash Hashem arranged it, that I will be there. And who was next to her in the room? Rav Belsky. Rav Belsky, the Pusek of Brooklyn, of America. Next door. 
And between Rav Blesky to her, there was a doctor on a computer, you know, they have computer on the on hallway. And she was, ah, ah, ah. Nothing. Son, she's suffering. Can you do something? Don't worry. Nothing. Why? That's all day, all day. They're not excited. It doesn't excite them. It doesn't bother them. They got used to it. So you see, I just gave you three reasons. Maybe there are other reasons. I don't know. And of course, not everyone is like that. Some are like that. Some not. If you already decide to be a doctor, you have to remember these points. Because that could be a very bad trap for your life even if you make millions, if you're going to get Hashem angry every day with your behaving towards the patients, it's not worth it. Same thing lawyers. <sighs> Tov, we'll move on. The people come to Moshe and they say, we want meat. Moshe comes and say, I did not give birth to them. What, what do you want from me? How can I get the meat to millions of people here? Did I give birth to them? So I ask, what's the connection if you gave birth to them or not? You are the king now. They come to you, what do you want? You don't have to be their biological father. From the fact that Moshe say, I'm not their biological father, what do we learn? That a father must take care of his children. But today, when there is a divorce case, not only he doesn't take care of his children most of the time, he used the children as hostages, him and her, both of them. In the war between him and her, the children are paying the biggest price. He destroyed them mentally. No wonder there'll be drug addicts in a few years, full of tattoos walking in the street at 2 a.m. at night. Why? Two selfish people, arrogant, egoistic, can care less about anyone besides their ego and their gain, will use anyone to get what they want to get. Revenge, whatever you want to call it. That's usually how the, the marriages end. Very rarely you find two gentlemen that decided that the marriage is not working. They tried, they went, they went to rabbis, marriage specialist, and in the end they shake hands. I will pray for you, for Shiduch, you pray for me. They, they have mutual custody, and they take care of everything, he pays all the bills, whatever is necessary. He didn't even need bedding. Immediately he gave her the get. He agreed, whatever, take the house, that you have a place to live, and I'll pay all the expenses and whatever. <laughs> Very rarely. <laughs> when you finally see someone like that, they deserve a big admiration, because usually people looking for revenge. Revenge. You know? So, there's, it's going deeper than what you say. Deeper. What is the main claim that the men say in a bed in when the woman sue for child support? Almost always the same answer. What is it? I don't have. I don't have. When you were married for 10 years, you had. Your credit cards are not maxed. You pay the house, you pay the mortgage, you pay all the bills, you pay the yeshivot. Everything was fine. What's changed now? Why all of a sudden you don't have? Oh, because if she doesn't want me, I'll kill her. I'll let her live on the street. But what about your children? You have an obligation to take care of your children. You just got a free babysitter. Think about it. Oh, but you hate the babysitter. She's your ex. You want her to choke and drop dead. You don't want to give her money. But what about the children? He cannot separate between his hate to the ex and his love to the children, if there is a love. So what? So his children's going to be on the street. He can care less. Every rabbi will call him and beg him, don't do that. I'm not giving them money. The answer of the Torah is, you must pay to feed your children and take care of all their needs, just like before you got divorced. 
And there is no right to say I don't have. Ah, maybe he got fired. Let's say, let's describe that he really doesn't have. Until now he was working. Because of the divorce, his boss found out. And they don't want him. Listen, you're not a good uh, influence to our company. Find yourself another job. And he's unemployed now. No, what's going to be now? How is he going to pay $10,000 expenses? The answer, he must go and collect charity. Must. That's his obligation. He cannot say, I don't have. It's his obligation to feed his children. And for every day he doesn't do it, is hell only getting deeper and deeper what's waiting for him. He thinks the divorce was his hell. He doesn't know what's coming for him. Because remember, today, in such a generation we live in, if you make your kids poor, and they have low self-esteem, and they hate their life, and they suffer already from a broken home, usually, almost for sure, they will go out of, of the derech. They will leave the religion, they will hate the religion, and they're going to make billions of sins. Every one of those sins is on you. You will have to be judged for. If you did everything you could, you gave them love and attention, and you pay and you try, okay, at least Hashem will take it to consideration. At least you did the maximum you could. But most men don't do that. Not that the ladies are perfect. Of course, they also have a lot to blame. But in the end, kids need their mother. Unless it's some crazy drug addict and who knows what, that she's a damage to the kids, which is not so common. Most of the time he fights to steal the kids from the wife. But for what? For selfish reasons. But they're going to have, they're going to be young kids without a mother. They're going to suffer every day. I don't care. I don't have them. She won't have them. And if she win in a court, it choked them to death. How many thousands of times you heard this? Jews and Goim. I won't have it. She won't have them. Boom. They kill the kids and kill themselves. Yes. <laughs> if you hear news, listen to the news. You heard it, I'm sure. How many cases like this ended in a massive tragedy. Look how far the selfishness goes. Do you understand why there are so many divorce cases? Divorce cases? Nobody touched the purpose of his existence. Shem put you in a world for a purpose, and you totally ignore it. Totally! You don't fix any one of your negative traits. Not your laziness, you don't care what time you wake up in the morning. Do you know what it means to lose Kriyat Shema? Do you know what a crime it is to wake up after 8.30? That Kriyat Shema is over? Do you know what a crime it is? Do you know how disappointed Hashem is from you? Oh, I went to sleep at 1 or 2, so what? If you had a flight to catch, you would be in the airport at 4, even if you went to sleep at 1. How many times I went to sleep for an hour, an hour and a half, and had to get up and head to the airport? Sometimes I didn't pay to go to sleep. I used to go to the airport, sleep there on the chair, waiting for the flight. An hour. How many? Well, I have to make it. It's more important. The flight is more important than Kriyat Shema. Kriyat Shema, do you know what it means? It's mitzvat aseh deoraita, kabalat ol malchut shamayim. Hashem is waiting for you to stand and say, Mode ani and he snores, 10 o'clock, he's still in bed. What an embarrassment. And he calls himself religious. Shabbat shows up at 11 o'clock. Ah, Rabbi, Baruch Hashem, we have Chabad here. Making a joke, like it's so funny that they start to daven at 10.40 in the morning. We might as well connect Shachrit and Mincha together. That's uh, something to be impressed of, to beg. Unbelievable. Especially in the winter time. You finish the meal, 6, 7 p.m. You come from Shul. 4.30, it's darkness already. You come from Shul 5.30, you sit until 7, 7.30. Then you're very tired from the food. You try to learn half an hour, but you fall asleep. Nine o'clock, you sleep already. Ten o'clock, you sleep. 
What time he wakes up? 10 o'clock the next morning. 12 hours he sleeps. Like the bears. Sleep for the whole season. <sighs> How did we end over here? <laughs> Tov? No, I know how we got here, but I'm saying how far we traveled, Baruch Hashem. This lecture, it's so unexpected, you don't know where, where you start, where you're going to end. But it's good, it's spontaneous. <laughs> but I still have the question that I didn't get to ask. It's still a question I want to ask. What's the question? They want to eat meat. They beg Hashem for meat. Right? They beg Hashem for meat. And they begin to eat the meat. And what happened? Boom. One is dead. The next one is dead. The third one died. People dying. You have now a piece of chicken. Slav. Nice bird. You want to eat it now? Your best friend just died. Your brother just died. Your father, your son. Your... What's going on here? Ah, I have to have it. I have to have it. I've seen people that destroyed their life for a momentary desire. I've seen people like this. Momentary desire. Such as someone cut him on the highway and he got so angry to satisfy his anger, he wanted to chase the guy and then ended up falling from a cliff or die or hit, or hit a truck. Took a life risk, very dangerous, you know, the way he maneuvered on the, on the road until he died. What got him killed? Couldn't control his anger. Met a girl about to do something. She told him, listen, I have uh, AIDS. You can, uh, I, I don't, I, no, no, his life is over. For one hour of desire, his life is over. Gambling. I'll tell you a story. When I was uh, 16, 17, we lived in Batyam, right by the beach. Batyam, the daughter of the sea. That's the name of the city, next to Tel Aviv. So we grew up, much like by the beach. I, I walked downstairs, walked a minute, and I was right there. Next to me, there was a woman, Iraqi-Israeli woman. Her name was Tsipora. Tsipora. Very skinny. All day smoking cigarettes like a man, you know? She light one cigarette from the other. Never you can catch her without a cigarette in her hand. Never. <coughs> Coughing like this. She decided to open a restaurant, close, small, the size of a store. How did she call it? She put a Tsipora. You heard about it? It's a famous franchise in Israel. She put a Tsipora. That's her. I knew her personally. It was in my neighborhood. Now it's all over Israel. Yeah, this big restaurant, fancy steakhouses. She had the son, Itzik. Why, why I always say in my lecture, Itzik, Itzik? This is the Itzik. <laughs> and she had a son-in-law, also Itzik. <laughs> she surrounded her with two Itzik. One small and one huge. So they called them Itzik Akatan and Itzik Agadol. You hear it? Itzik HaKatan, Itzik HaGadol. Her son was Itzik HaKatan. The tall one was Itzik HaGadol, the son-in-law. She opened the restaurant. Major success. People, non-stop, lafo, chish kebab. She's doing well. The next thing, she took the next door. Made it big, then one day renovation, made it mamash fancy, then opened another one, and another one, and another one. Then it became franchise, people like McDonald's, people pay them 
to use the name. And her son one day lost all the restaurants, tens of millions of dollars in card game, gambling, in one night. What took years to build, in an hour or two of stupidity, he lost everything. That big guy, Itzik Agadol, opened his own restaurant, and then a factory for meat, and he has, a, I think, a restaurant in Los Angeles. It's called Itzik Agadol. <laughs> Google it. Itzik Agadol. Now you know where it started. That was her son-in-law. Then she passed. And the rest is history. Someone took all the restaurants in a gambling on cards. So I've seen people destroy their life in a minute. Many, many times. It happens all the time. To build takes years. To bring down a building takes an hour. That's how Hashem made the world. So the question that I have right now is, as much as your desire for a piece of meat, let's say you just came out of Auschwitz, years, you were eating one piece of bread and a lousy cold soup, which was only water with a little color, there was really no soup. For years, you look like a skeleton. You see this tripod? That's how you look. And now you smell an unbelievable steak. Ah, I miss those days I was rich in Berlin, in my mansion. Chris, the servant, used to come and say, Sir, the steak is ready. I'll be with you in a minute, Chris. Ah, memories came back. The steak is right here. But your friends say, listen, I saw the German put poison on the steaks. I don't even know if he put on this one, but I've seen it. I saw poison. Cyclone B. They put on a steak. You can die in a terrible way. Will he eat the steak? No, he won't. No. He survived Auschwitz to eat the steak now and die after all the suffering. Finally, he's free. He's about to come to America. He wanted the steak. The desire is huge. But he wanted the steak. Who wants to die now? For steak. So you tell me, please, what's going on here in the parasha? Everybody reads it and reads it every year. Nobody thinks. What's going on here? They die or the basar ben shinehem. First I thought, maybe the death was not instant. You read it now, they died a month later. That's why the Torah made sure to write that they die, that the meat is still stuck between their teeth, meaning momentarily. I don't have an answer for this. It's a big mystery. How can you eat when you just saw everyone else who eats dies around you? And anyone think he has an answer? Huh? Tzfardea, you have a good point. He said the same thing like Tzfardea. Why? There was one big frog. The Egyptian hit it, it became two. Hit it again, became four. Hit it again, became eight. Hey, you fool, stop. The more you hit it, the more danger you're going to have. But that's anger. Anger, it's very hard to stop. That's why the Gemara say, En meratzim adam bishat kaso. Person is mad now? Don't give him rational talk. That's going to make him even angrier. According to what the Torah said, that they die while the, teeth is in the, the meat is between their teeth, meaning moment, instantly, within a minute. So then you see thousands of bodies. At least at that point you should have stopped. How do you make an angry person who's ready to choke someone smile within two seconds? You know this? No, you don't. These people that they're red now, their veins in their forehead popping up, 
They are ready to kill someone. Where is he? And you go like this. And he smiled and he forgot about everything. I'll tell you two stories. Once, I went in Batiam, where I live, right next to Chipudet Zipporah, there was a place called the Passage. Passage. Passage means, I think it's a French word. Huh? Passage. Yeah, it's a place that you go from one side of the street to the other, and it's under the building. So that means there is a roof. There's stores on both sides. Okay, like a, like a mall. Tiny mall. Straight. There was a shoe store. They used to have shoes made in Italy. It was owned by a father of someone from my school. And there was a lady working there selling shoes. She was in charge of the store. Sometimes the father was there, most of the time the lady. One time finally I had enough money to buy a nice pair of shoes. But I'm standing by the window thinking which one I should get. This, this, that. And I see the woman is screaming, angry, cursing, screaming. And it goes on and on and on. It's already minutes. The conversation only gets worse. She's fighting with someone on the phone. I say, you know what? The heck with this. I'm walking in. I was waiting for her to relax. But she's not going anywhere. Just when I walked in, Hi. Mashlamcha. <laughs> How are you today? Can I help you? Switch! Why? Commission. 300 shekels. You're going to make 50 shekels. Commission. Now oh, she became... What do you see? Money can ease the anger in seconds. If the person is greedy. If the person is not greedy, he has a problem. He may not help. <laughs> but my father, Allah Shalom, once told me a story. You know, he was a diamond uh, maker. Not cutter. Someone else was cutting the raw diamonds. And he would make the shape of it. Sh the shiny ending. So, you know, from time to time, I used to go to the factory in Ramat Gan to see how they make the diamonds. My father told me, before you were born, we didn't have refrigerators. And we didn't have milk like today. You go to the store, it's all pasteurized in plastic boxes or in carton uh, boxes. It wasn't like that. The guy that sold milk used to bring it directly from the cows in bottles, bottles of one liter, with the cover. Fresh! Five o'clock in the morning, it was in a farm. They milk all the cows there in the middle of the night. He fill up all the bottles, and he has a bicycle, two big wheels in the front, one in the back. He sits on the back wheel, and he goes like this and scream. Or he has a bell, halav, and all the workers hear from the window. And what was his name? Shmuel, but he was Hasidish. So how the Shmuel is in Hasidish? Shmil, Shmil. One time Shmiel brought them bottles of milk and everybody paid him half a lira for, for one. When they came to drink, one of the bottles was sour. It was hot days, maybe between 5 a.m. until 10 a.m. and already got spoiled. When the, there's nothing worse than spoiled milk. Ugh, just to smell it, you want to die. The, the worker in a, in a factory smelled it. Drink it. Yeah. As Shmiel going up, down, back to his, uh, to his uh, bicycle, the guy from the second floor spilled the milk on his head. Like this. He looked up, Shmiel. The anger got him. And he started to run up there. He saw the, the guy. The guy got nervous. Oh, he get, what am I going to do? He said, it's going to kill me now. <laughs> so there is about 30 seconds to walk up. There's no elevator. There's no nothing. We're talking about 60 years ago. So the guy is running upstairs. As he's going to walk in, 
he have 30 seconds to come up with a solution. My father waited by the door with one lira. A bottle is half a lira. That's like two bottles. Here, Shmil, for you. Stood like this, thinking, have a nice day. Zang zoom. Turn around and left. Forgot the anger, forgot the milk on his head. Whatever he gave him, it's a little bit money. Yeah, wow, he saved my life. <laughs> so you see, some people, their love for money is greater than the anger. Once the money comes, they're willing to overcome the anger. Some people are very proud and very stingy. Sometimes they collide with each other. You want to show off, but it will cost you money. How, what are you going to do now? You want to make a show off because you like uh, ego and attention. But you're dying not to spend money. Now we're going to see what desire is stronger by you. Ego or stinginess? If you're willing to let go the pride, meaning because it's going to cost you too much, then you love money more than you are proud. If you're going to burn the money because the, the ego is so important to you, you're stingy, but you, your pride is stronger than your stinginess. Same thing, laziness. You have greed for money, but at the same time you're lazy. Now you want to know which one of the two is stronger? Check in the morning. What time he wakes up? A salesman. If he starts his day, his day at 8 a.m., then he's going to make an extra customer a day. In a period of month, it's another $5,000 net to his pocket. If he wakes up at 10, he starts his first appointment at 11.30, that's $5,000 minimum less every month. So now what is the conclusion? That is laziness overcome his greed for money. But if his greed for money overcome his laziness, he will set five alarms and will threat his wife to make sure that 8 a.m. is out of the door. It's on you if I don't wake up. It's on you. Be careful. Why? God forbid he would lose a, a dollar, forget $5,000. So he comes out of the door like this with his coffee. Oh, I hate it. But he loves money. Huh? Uh, you know, we all know it. But when it comes to reality, how many people really live by it? Huh? Mr. Tawil, you tell me. Very few. Very few. Here you go. You answer yourself. Someone that has strong confidence and faith in Hashem never bothers an hour a month about mm -hmm. money. Nothing. Just dive in, learn Torah. What happened, Hashem? I'm in your hand. Ashlech yavcha al Hashem v'uichal kelecha. The Gemara says, someone that has what to eat today and doesn't have for tomorrow and is worried. But for today, yes. For today, you set. And you worry what you're going to eat tomorrow. Ktan amana. Meaning his fate is almost zero. Very low. Meaning all of us are like this. Who can raise his hand and say that if today he has enough money to feed his children from 8 to 8, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it's covered. But for tomorrow breakfast, you need to sit there, send your kids to school, you don't have. Your wife needs to go quickly in the morning to buy bread, uh, cheese, whatever, to make them sandwiches, no money for that. For today, you have food. But for tomorrow morning, there's nothing to eat. No eggs, no nothing. Would you sleep at night? You wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Before you go to sleep, you would run everywhere to get enough money, at least for breakfast. And then from breakfast to lunch, I'm going to see how I'm going to manage. But it definitely won't go to snore. Moshe, in six hours, I have to feed the kids. Seven kids going to yeshiva. Don't disturb me. It's great night. Ah, nice weather. Open the window. Let me enjoy. Moshe, I cannot sleep. Why do you always worry? Where is your emunah? <laughs> I want to tell you, we'll finish here. 
You tell me about the meat. I don't have an answer for it. It's a big mystery. Maybe you have an answer. Maybe you find someone who say something we can understand. It's a mystery. But I'm going to tell you now a story that I told a few times in the past. But for those of you who did not hear it, just for that it was worth it for you to come. We used to have a guy in yeshiva. He moved to Israel about six, seven years ago. His name was Lior. No? Lior. Edri. Remember this name. Israeli Baal Tshuva. At that time, it was two years Baal Tshuva in yeshiva. Two years. Two years in yeshiva. Learning, working on his emunah. Leo Redri. He had some kind of a siata de shmaya that he has very strong level of emunah. Big believer. One time he walks in the street, a person came to him. Ah, I am collecting. I have to marry my daughter. I don't have money. He already had $100 in his pocket. That's his total net worth. Bachur Yeshiva, $100. Yes, that's it. He took the $100 and he gave him the whole money. He didn't want to ask for change, nothing. He told me, I walked one block next to the gas station on Main Street in Monsi, I see a hundred dollar on the floor. That's how Hashem runs with it. Unbelievable. One time, his parents decided to come visit him. A few years, he's not in Israel. He can't leave. Once he leaves, he can come back. He doesn't have American passport. His parents decided to come to Monsi for two weeks. Leo, find us a place to stay. Monsi, it's a city of Chesed. People host. He found them a room somewhere, not far from the yeshiva. The parents came, four big suitcases, you know. Shopping, this. Then the father said to him, Leo, tomorrow morning the flight is very early in JFK. We will need, if you can get a minivan, we cannot fit four big suitcases, me and your mother and you, three people, plus four big suitcases in a regular car. We need a minivan. Minivan, you put two in a trunk, two in a back seat, you fold the chair, you have a room. <laughs> Lior said, don't worry, Abba. Hashem knows you have a flight. You will get to the flight, relax. <laughs> He told me, I have no idea where I'm going to get him. Forget it, leave minivan. Any car. Where will I get a car? It's five o'clock in the morning. We have to get ready to get to leave, to drive to JFK. I have no idea where I'm going to get a car. I'm going to sleep. 5 a.m. in the morning, I wake up. And, and his father all day, the day before, Leo, he took care of a car. Abba, Alti, Dag, I told you, don't worry. You're going to have a car. Don't worry. Hashem, you know I need a car, I'm in your hand. Five o'clock in the morning he wakes up, darkness, very quiet, very few people wakes up five o'clock in the morning. He goes down to the mikveh in yeshiva. He's in the mikveh, me'ayin yavo ezri, in half an hour I have to get a minivan and everyone is asleep. Where will I get a minivan? He's in the mikveh, who comes into the mikveh? Another guy from the yeshiva, Married guy, what's his name? Gilad Busi. On purpose I tell you names. I can also tell you where these people live today in Israel. Both of them. Gilad Busi, Baal Tshuva, Tzadik, Talmit Chacham today. He comes into the mikveh. What is Gilad Busi do for a living? He learns all day to in yeshiva. And he buys online cars from the auction in Mannheim without checking the car. Shem, I'm in your hand. I don't want to cancel my Torah learning. I want to be able to learn all day. If I'm going to drive to Pennsylvania and come back, that's a whole day. I don't want to waste time on going, checking the cars, towing it. I pay $300. They deliver the car. Finish. Back, back, that's how it was back then. He looks at all the cars that are for sale. Bid on this, this. Buy two, three cars. Send them somehow the money. I don't know how it works. 
And they deliver the car, and he put the cars by the parking next to Walmart with the <laughs> for sale sign. He get a call, sell the car, make $2,000 profit or 1000 Like this, every two, three weeks, he gets new cars, and that's how he makes a living. While he learns full time. He comes in a mix for five or five. He sees Leo Redri. Ah, Boker Tov Gilad, how are you? Tell me. You have any idea where I can get now a minivan? I have to take my parents to JFK. He takes the key. I just bought from the auction yesterday a minivan. Here, you have a dealer plate on it. Minivan. <laughs> just like that. Five or five in the morning. No. What do you say? I know some of you are still skeptic. They would say, ah, great coincidence. Absolutely not. To say something like this is coincidence is heresy. Heresy. Kfirah. Because Hashem saw he had such faith in him, and he's relaxed, and he's not going crazy, not running, knocking on door. Hashem, I'm in your hand. Whatever you want will happen. That's it. I have to help him. He's counting on me. I'm not going to let him down. But if we count on him and him and him and him and her and he, no, they'll help you. He'll manage. You are in good hands. Do you understand, Rabotai? It's similar to a father that has ten sons and one of them is slow. The nine are very sharp. From very young age, they buy, they sell. They're wheeler dealers. In yeshiva, they get drinks. It starts with drinks. They buy it in Costco for 30 cents, sell it for $2. That's how it starts. By the age 18, they already have ten, twenty thousand $20,000 on the side. Then they do big business. You see right away, they know how to sell. But this guy's slow. Not so smart, not such a great learner. What is he going to do, this poor guy? Is he going to work in a restaurant serving falafel? Who the father feel obligated to help more? To that slow one. The other nine are jealous. You're not giving us anything. Only him, him, him. You want to replace him? No. God forbid. That's why I have to be his babysitter. Same thing with Hashem. You show that you're talented. I'm going to go to college. I'll be a doctor. I'll be a surgeon. I'll make millions. I'll buy. I sell. No problem. Do it. Adios. Without amigo. He's not an amigo of Hashem, someone like that. But Hashem, I'm a loser. I'm nothing. I'm worthless. You know me. I don't know anything. What do I know? I'm in your hand. You are indeed in my hand. Now I have to take care of you. There are hundreds of verses like this in the Tanakh to back up what I just told you. One of them I can tell you from the top of my head. Baruch HaGever Asher Iftach Ba'ashem Arur HaGever Asher Iftach Ba'adam Arur, you know what it means, Arur? Cursed. Cursed be the man that trusts other men. That's the curse of the snake. Arur Atami Kol Chayat HaSadeh And bless the one that trusts Hashem. Even when Hashem sends you a messenger to help you with your need, make sure you're not getting confused to give the credit to the messenger, forgetting that it's all Hashem. You still have gratitude for the messenger. Why? He did nothing. It's all Hashem. Why you have to have gratitude for the messenger? Because this particular messenger had a test right now. If to give you money or not. He heard that you need money, you have tomorrow your rent, you don't have money. Someone told him. Hashem made someone tell him. He could have declined it, ignore it, and move on. Then Hashem would send that, man, that person to another rich man to hear that you need money for the rent. One of the five would perform. So he chose to help. That's why you owe him gratitude. But the decision that you're going to have enough money for the rent tomorrow was Hashem's decision. It must happen. 
even if I run it by a hundred people, if all hundred people would choose not to help, I would make you find a wallet or some money somewhere. No problem. However, the fact that the messenger chose to help, to do it, for that you owe him gratitude. Plus, there is another reason. There's another reason. The second reason is because Hashem used people that have good merit to perform good in the world. So if the Savior, the savior was Him, it's no, not coincidence. That means He has some kind of a merit. And thanks to that, Hashem used Him to perform the mitzvah. That's the second reason why you owe Him a gratitude. If he was a wicked person, it wouldn't be him. The fact that he was doing something right got Hashem to offer him a bonus to do another something right. One more thing. And that's written in the Talmud, who knows where? No, no. Tu ma'amare chazal. Megalgelim schut al yedeh zakai. Megalgelim chova al yedeh chayav. Merit spreads by people with merit, and negative things spread by people that have negative merits. And there is another Ma'amar Chazal. What, what does it say? Huh? Yafeh me'od, the rabbit said over there. Mitzvah goreret mitzvah, ve'avera goreret avera. You did something good? immediately Hashem sends you away another opportunity for another mitzvah. You're going to do that mitzvah, another opportunity comes. Don't take it for granted. It's only thanks to the previous mitzvah. When that chain will cut, that you will decline one of the opportunities. That right there, there will not be more. You cut the chain. Now you're going to decide on your own to do something. That's going to lead you to more chain reaction of mitzvot. And Avera, sins, immediately sends you away a temptation to do another one, and another one, and another one. When will it stop? When you overcome that desire, and now I won't do it. I won't commit the sin. Once you overcame the, the, the test, the chain of temptations will cut right here. You have all the answers to everything that happens in Judaism. Everything. The Goim copy from us, Christians, the Muslims, many of the things they saw what the Jews say and talk, they learn, so they teach. Baruch Hashem, at least the world learn a lot of positive things from the Jews. No wonder Muhammad called us the nation of the book, Amma Sefer. <laughs> they know who gives civilization to the world. But everything is in the Talmud. Everything. Everything is in the Rambam. Everything in, his, in every book you open, you see it, the treasure. So many answers. To, you know how many thousands of times people wrote to me email, Rabbi, every time I have a hard question, the next lecture I listen of yours, I get my answer. Magic, magic. I get in a car, I place the next lecture on the line, boom, you answer in my dilemma. Why? Hashem directs it this way. It's all for Hashem. <laughs> Remember the story about Dave? You heard about Dave? There was one guy. One guy said, I'm going to stop keeping Shabbos. He left yeshiva, went back to his city somewhere in America, and he said, Hashem, if you care, send me a sign. From, from noon, he waits six, seven hours until Shabbos starts, send me a sign that you want me to keep Shabbos. No sign. Shabbos started. He's thinking, should I turn on the TV or no? Shabbos started around 7, 8. Waited until 9, 10. I'm waiting for a sign. I didn't turn the TV on yet. It's debating. 11, 12. Send me a sign. Your last chance. 
If I get a sign in the next 10 minutes, I keep Shabbos. If not, I stop. 10 minutes passed, no sign. No sign. He turned on the TV after midnight. What show? David Lederman show. Remember those days? Is he still alive? Huh? He's still alive. Dave Lederman show. Talk show. And the night. Friday night. He turned the TV on. Dave Lederman is interviewing a filmmaker that just came back from Israel. And he said to him, so how was it in Israel? Very nice. Did you learn some Hebrew? Actually, I did. Shabbat Shalom, Dave. <laughs> he said to David, Dave Lederman, Shabbat Shalom, Dave. When? Two seconds after that Jew from the yeshiva turned on the TV, and his name is Dave. David. He turned on the TV. What does he see? Shabbat Shalom, Dave. I thought that there was a Jew. That say Shabbat Shalom today. Someone wrote me an email a month ago, Rabbi, you got the story wrong. I thought maybe I messed up the whole story. You know. Okay, what did I do wrong? He said, it wasn't a Jew, it was a Goy. Oh, it makes the story better. That a Goy stayed in Hebrew to Dave Lederman. I came back from Israel, I filmed the movie there. Shabbat Shalom, Dave. He got a sign. Why? No, use your head. Why? Because he didn't have a merit to get a sign. What do you think? Everyone who wash him? Let's go, let's go. No? I will play my flute and you dance according to my music. No. After he already fell, Hashem showed him you understand? Because he didn't have the merit. It's not Abraham Avin. What is he? Nachum Mishgoat Gamzu, Rabbi Akiva. There are very few people in the history of the world that say to Hashem, they need something now, and immediately Hashem ran to do it. Usually it doesn't happen. That's, I, that I don't know. The rest of the story, I don't know. Did he go back to Yeshiva? I, I hope so. I hope so. I had a miracle like this one time. Not less than this. What? I went to Daven Shachris by Vishnitz. Vishnitz, it's a big building in Monsi. Every 15 minutes, another minyan start. Starts in sunrise. Every 15 minutes, this class, 8, 8.15, 8.30, 8.45, 9, 9.15. Yeah, shtibel. So, I see there, I don't know, 8-ish, we're in the middle of the minyan. My friend, Shimon Elbaz, walks in, sitting next to me on the bench with his son. This son is married already with kids. This was over 20 years ago, that story. He sits next to me, he said, I forgot to bring money. I want to give $5 to my son to buy a cake. Son was a little kid. Do you have $5 to lend me? And I check. I said, no, I only have a $100 bill. So give it to me, I'll bring you change. Got his son a cake, brings me $95 change. I owe you $5. Tough, $5. Few weeks, maybe even months went by. One time we needed to go, the yeshiva needed to buy paper goods. You know, the yeshiva every few months, they buy from Costco, the plates, the everything, plastic plates. There was one guy, Aaron Nachmani, today he lives in Ramat Bet Shemesh, also have kids that married already. Look how the world is evolving. <laughs> he was a single guy back then, in yeshiva in charge of the paper goods. He said to me, when are you going to Costco? I want to come with you because I want to buy for the yeshiva. I say, today I'm going to go. I'll pick you up. I picked him up. We're going now to Costco. I say to him, you know what? I'm afraid we're not going to finish and then it's going to get dark. 
let's go Davin uh, Mincha to be safe and then we go. Where are we going to go? Vishnitz. I go to Vishnitz. We finish Mincha. We're about to go out. I see a box of books. Maybe 50 books on the table. Each book has a price on it, written. It's all used books. Some of them are like brand new. Someone wanted to sell these books. He left them over there. And next to it, he put a box, metal box, like a donation box, pushka box. You put the money in. You have to have the exact money. There's no change. He put the box hanging on the doorknob. I'm now thinking, where, um, where will I find the guy? I'm looking now. I, wa- I found a book of Rav Shimshon Pinkus Zatzal about raising children. Not such a big book. Five dollars. I checked. I have only twenty dollars. I asked him, Aaron, you have five dollars on you? No. He said, where will I get five dollars to put in a box? I asked the guy, do you know who owns the books? He will come tonight. He leaves them in the morning. It's common by religious people. You want to sell something, you leave the box there with all the merchandise. You put a place to put the money and you go. And nobody steals. Everybody comes, take what they want, and they put the money. The store runs by itself while he's learning Torah. There used to be, when I used to daven there, they had uh, 10 boxes of cheese Danish. 25 years ago, it was $1 each. Probably today, it's $4 each. How much it cost today? It was $1 each. There was a box and, and maybe a 1,000 cheesecakes. 10 boxes. Everyone take it after davening a cheesecake, Danish, put one dollar in. One time I saw the guy coming to take the money. I asked him, tell me, did you ever have uh, any money missing? He said, actually, one time I had one dollar missing. One time in years. But one time I had an extra dollar. You know what it means. That the person that took the cheese didn't have a dollar on him. A few days later, he came there and he put the dollar. So he never had a dollar missing. Think about it. So I'm waiting now. Where, where would I get five dollars? I asked. Him. All of a sudden, who shows up? From the, from the hallway, comes out. Five dollars in his hand. I'm looking for you for weeks. I owe you five dollars for the for the cake. I take the five dollars, <laughs> put it in a box. I say, Aaron, Raita, five dollars? Hashem already prepared two months ago. That five dollars I'll give him for his son for that moment. Why Hashem did it? Hashem could have made me have five dollars in my pocket that day. It wouldn't be a miracle. He wants to show you I run the world. From time to time, Hashem loves to do it. Why? It's a smack to wake you up. It's a love patch. You know love patch? What does it mean a love patch? I give you an example. Let's say you walk on the street and all of a sudden someone hits you in the back. Boom! Broke your spine. Your blood begins to circulate. Your fist is ready. You're about to turn and break someone's teeth. Your best friends in life. Moshe! Wow, five years, how you been? Wow, it's it. Wow, wow, wow. What's up, man? <laughs> what happened? The anger that you were really to break someone's face for doing what he did to you right now, or the smack on your back like this, who is the chatzuf that is dare, daring to do such thing? You turn around, you see the love of your life there. The anger in less than a second turned to hugs and kisses and happiness and tears of joy. That's Hashem. If you remember the punch you just got now, or the accident you just had, or the, or the leg you just broke, or the money you just lost in the stock market, it was a love patch on Hashem on your, on your back. And you just turned around and you saw it was Hashem. Son, it's me. Why do you upset? <laughs> I'm so honored. 
Why are you on here? You just took money from me. That means you care about me. <laughs> you, you're punishing me. I'm so honored. That means you care about what I do. That's called negative attention. Why kids do sometimes bad things? They try to get their parents' attention. They try to get attention. It's called negative attention. Negative attention. So, Rabotai, Ramash, before we finish, we pray Arvit. This is, all, this is all about when you recognize who is the one who just hit me. If you live a life with no ashgacha, no emuna, what do you say? Ah, it's all coincidence. I call teva, nature. It's very, very disappointing, frustrating, and painful. But if you know the one who loves you the most in the world just gave you a smack, if you're smart, you cry from happiness, not from pain. Why are you so happy? Why are you so happy? Baba Sali just gave me a smack. That means he cared about me. Other people did what I did. He didn't even look at them. To me, he called me and he pinched me. Don't do that. Wow. For years, you will tell it to your kids and to your grandkids. Why? I got a smack from the Baba Sali. Why? Baba Sali told me, Lomatim lecha to do such a thing. Someone else did it. He didn't care about him. From all the people, he cared about you. But you have a better honor than this? I always say, if the Baba Sali would ask you to go buy him a tea, 10 minutes away in, a, in 90 degrees now, usually you're lazy. You don't like to sweat. No air condition on the street. If your friend would ask you to go get him a tea, get yourself, leave me alone. Ma, it's hot now. What do you know? Why do you need tea now? It's too hot. But if the Baba Sali asks you to bring him tea, how you run with happiness on the street? The sweat will be like a cold shower. Why? You see that the difficulties in life, it's all in the head. It's how your head, underst your head understands that. When you understand it's something great and productive, the suffering turns into joy. When you don't, every little thing is suffering. Here you go. That's what they say in Israel, a kol barosh. So you have to reprogram your head. If the head is reprogrammed with Jewish ashkafa, ashkafa yehudit amitit, most of your problems are gone right away. You barely have any suffering. Why? Because even the suffering... You know I'm earning a lot of money right now. This suffering will turn into Olam Abba, into a good place in Gan Eden. Who can cry for something like this? When you work very hard knowing you're making a thousand dollars an hour, you care about the hard work? They're offering you a twenty dollars an hour, sitting in the office answering phone calls in air condition. Twenty dollars an hour. Or walking in a highway in 90 degrees, sunny, hot, humid, lifting up uh, bricks. Thousand dollars an hour. Eight hours a day, eight thousand dollars. Eight, hour, uh, eight hours in the office with the air condition, 160 bucks. Do you know one person who would want to sit in the office? What, everyone is crazy? Everyone is sadistic? Masochist? What? You like to suffer in the heat? No. Everyone hates the heat. Everyone hates the job. Everyone hates to walk in the highway. But everyone loves money. And the money makes the job sweet. No suffering. Remember my uncle with the pizza shop? He works with the Arabs, three Arabs. My rich uncle and three Arabs. Five, six in the morning, taking all the dough. Preparing, they're going to sell two, three thousand pizzas today. Very, very successful business. He has his apron and the Arabs. The three Arabs are preparing the door. Panim Tisha Be'av. Their face, they want to die. One of them, I remember, his name was Sami. Like this. 
And my rich uncle works harder than them because it's his business. Like all the flowers everywhere, breathe the flower. I asked my father one time, how come he's so happy and they're so sad? Because they make a few dollars an hour, a few shekels an hour. He makes millions. Look at the register open. Trim, 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 trim. He gives him energy. He enjoys every time he presses on a door. 10, 20, 30 shekels, 40, 50, 60, 70. Counting the money. To count money in a hard day, it's also disturbing. But no one complains about it. If someone wants to give you a million dollar cash today, in one condition, you have to stand outside in a hundred degrees and count it there. No, I'm Mr. Nice. It's too hot. Keep the million for yourself. Huh? Make sense or no? You get the point? Baruch Hashem. Tov, any questions before we finish in prayer of it? I really don't know. If a person is supposed to die, you mean in a natural way, that's the last day of his life, not because of a punishment, because that's it, today he finished his mission in life, then in the last day of his life he has no Bechira, Hashem send him to where he's supposed to die. But if you have all of a sudden a thousand, two thousand, five thousand people in one area, they're all dying because of something they are doing right now. That's definitely they had Bechira, because if they didn't have Bechira to eat the meat, why would they die? That means Hashem is angry at them that they eat the meat and because of the ta'ava for the basar, they all died. So it's not because they were supposed to die today. They are dying because they are now chosen to get Hashem angry. There are many examples like this in the Torah, like Korach ve'adato. They come to fight Moshe and Hashem swallowed them, the land swallowed them all alive. If they wouldn't do what they did, they would live many more years to live, to go, you know. They didn't have to die. So that's a very big mystery. If anyone has an answer, Rabbi Mizrahi at gmail.com. Adam, they didn't have experience. He ate, he, Hashem told him, don't eat from the tree, and he ate. Did he know? No, he didn't know anything from his life. It's the first opportunity, and he messed up. He didn't know what it means, you die, what does it mean to die. It's something new. Here, I want to come now eat shish kebab. Here, I have a piece of, what you call it, call it in Hebrew, pargiot. Pargit, baby chicken. My friend ate, died. My brother ate, died. My neighbor ate, died. My friend, other friend died. Everyone around me fall and die. Will I touch the meat? I don't think one person in the world will dare to touch the meat. But it's written in the Torah that means thousands ate the meat after they saw other people dying. I was thinking about many possibilities. Maybe all of them died in the same second. All the ones gathered together. But it's very unlikely that everyone will eat exactly in the same second. And died exactly in the same second. It's very un- unlikely. Let me ask you a question. Every person that smokes cigarettes, you know cigarettes kill? Yeah. yeah. Why they smoke? You know why? Because of cases like Rav Kaduri. Rav Kaduri is a tzal. When I tell people, why you smoke? It's going to kill you. What does he say? Not everyone that smokes die young. In Rav Kaduri lived to 105. Thousands of people die from cancer. One Rav Kaduri, Tzadik Esod Olam, Hashem decided to keep him alive. So what, did they, what does he learn from? From Rav Kaduri. That's not shayach to you. You're not Rav Kaduri. You are one of the thousand. But there is a hope. I may get lucky. That shows you the tavait. So I agree with you. You give a good example. The desire is very strong. But the question is, every desire that the punishment will be later on, maybe yes, maybe not, I can understand how people are willing to take the risk, even though it's very stupid, but we see people do it all the time. I'm not asking about that. I'm asking right now, you, you know, you saw me now putting poison in a glass. Poison. 
I gave it to one person, he drank and died. Next one, died. Next one, died. I said, come, drink. Who's going to drink? If you want to commit suicide, you drink. Other than that, nobody wants no. So what's going on over here? Big mystery. Smoke me. This, the, the, this question is a general question, and every person gets a different answer for it. In order for me to answer this question, I have to first know the family. I have to know the kids. I have to know their schools. I have to know the parnasa of the husband, the wife, their situation, their community, where they planning to go in Israel, what synagogue they're going to belong to, what parnasa they're going to have in Eretz Israel. Uh, how much money they take with them. There are hundreds of things to check first before a rabbi say to a family, live all the good life you have here, live the yeshivot of your children, live the parnasa of the husband, live the wonderful chevruta that he has and the, and the business that he has or whatever he has, and take a risk, take all the children, move them to Israel. They don't speak Hebrew. They're not going to have yeshivot. They're going to be on the streets. Their life will be destroyed just to live in a holy land. That's obviously not responsible. So the question, the answer to your question, only your personal rabbi can answer that. If you have a rabbi that knows you well. If not, we have to go to very big chacham and give him all the details. Everything. Then he see everything. It's in every decision like this, there's good and bad. There's no such thing of making aliyah and everything will be perfect. There's no such thing of staying here and everything will be perfect. There's good and bad in everything. So that's why some people, they have a business over here that they do online. It doesn't matter if they live in America. The husband won't make money on a computer, I don't know, in a stock market. Buy and sell. He can be in Israel. He doesn't need to be in America for that. But what happens if you have a business here in America? And that's how he makes all his money, and he supports the kolel, and he helps his chatanim and kalot. And now he's going to shut everything and move to Israel and won't have income. Two, three years, finish all his savings, and every one of his chatanim, kalot, kulam will be starving, they won't have anything. That's a very, very big life and death decision. One of the things you said in your question is the children love it here, and they don't want to move to another country and to start going to yeshivot with Israeli kids, and they don't know the language, and it will be hard for them to learn in, in Israel in Hebrew, because they probably don't know Hebrew, and that's a very big thing to consider. So the, the question is, if to make aliyah, it's a different question for every person. For some people the answer is yes, for some people the answer is no. Rav Chaim Kanievsky Zatzal, was very much into tell people to make aliyah, very much. But I know few people in Israel that he told them go to America. Most, he was very much convincing people to make aliyah to Israel. But some people in Israel, even some of them that came from America to Israel and didn't do so good, he said to them go back to America. So it's depend on the person. That's why we don't, I don't know you enough to tell you what to do, what not to do. It's, uh, even uh, when, uh, when someone comes to a rabbi and says, should I do the surgery or not? If it's Rav Ben Zion, Abba Shaul Zatzal, Dadev Ruach HaKodesh, he can answer. But regular rabbis, they don't have Ruach HaKodesh. If they want to give you an advice to do the surgery or not, can they take a risk that Chas Shalom, someone will die? So in order for them to answer, they have to have all the medical, uh, uh, medical results. They have to consult with the doctor that they ask questions. What, what is this? What's the odds? To find out about that. There's so many things to investigate. You cannot just tell a person, do the surgery and you'll be fine. What happens if he dies? 
Who's going to pay for it? Or don't do the surgery. Don't do it. You're good. Well, he doesn't do the surgery and he died one month later. I've seen cases like this. That people went to some babot in Israel and they gave them a horrible advice and that was their debt. That's what Hashem says, Arur HaGever Asher Iftach Ba'adam. He did the Goral Agra. Can he went lechet sel Aaron? Lechet sel Moshe. But he was Aaron, and Hashem said to Aaron, lechet sel Moshe. It was too obvious. Yes. 